Riviera Hotel, India, Echo, Lima, Delta, Shield. Ten years, three performers, three different stories told three completely different ways. They fought each other, they fought the world, and they continued to fight for their name. 2012 was the year that The Shield made their debut, and it sounds weird to say now, but look at these guys. Did you think that they'd become the flag bearers of the wrestling industry? If you're saying yeah, you're probably lying. That day in November, it didn't seem very likely, but all these years later, here we stand with Seth Rollins, John Moxley, and Roman Reigns as the cornerstones of the wrestling business in North America, carrying their respective brands with consistency, high-level matches, complex stories, great character work, and an unmatched drive to be and remain the best. For the past 10 years, these three have dominated. The Shield was the most popular stable WWE had had since Evolution and that was all the way back in 2003. Their simple premise, ability to do a little bit of everything and simple but effective rise was something that people just didn't think was possible in the new WWE. It's very rare that all three guys come out of a faction and all equate to the same success that these men have. And for the past decade, The Shield has had an ironclad grip on the business, creating three superstars who have not only built a great legacy, but entertained us through great matches, moments, and stories which, as time goes on, just like them, become legendary. This is The Shield's Decade of Dominance. The greatest crop of young talent to ever grace the WWE is the OVW4, four men whose accomplishments, mainstream reach, and overall legacy in the business speaks for itself. Batista, John Cena, Brock Lesnar, and Randy Orton were integral in shaping the WWE for 20 plus years. Now at legendary status, those four are also a template on how to build stars and take calculated risks to do so. WWE let them shine on their own, put them against legends, or simply just let them simmer long enough to the point where the crowd was really hungry for them to become a top star. From slow burn stories to authentically connecting with the audience to mega pushes and one guy flat out killing every legend in his path, WWE with these guys developed four of the biggest stars ever. But once they'd hit their peak, WWE struggled to create stars of a high stature and make no mistake, they've not created stars of these four's magnitude since. The people who watched these guys' entire career know how big they were at their peak. Where I'm going with this is around that 2009 to 2014 area, WWE tried with different experiments and more often than not, they failed. Too much too soon, not connecting with the audience, the wrong character, horrible gimmicks, or just a flat out lack of skills were just some of the reasons they couldn't rebuild and give audiences new characters to sink their teeth into and move into a new generation. But in 2012, that changed. Let's forget OVW and look down to FCW. Here we'd see a young man formerly known as Tyler Black. Well-traveled and having competed in professional wrestling since 2005, he was scooped up by the WWE in 2010. Technically sound, proficient on the mic, and rest assured, very confident of his abilities, he was a gem in the WWE pipeline. He began competing at an early age and his love of wrestling and undeniable talent landed him a contract with the biggest wrestling giant in the world. With him was a man by the name of John Moxley, now turned Dean Ambrose. For him, he'd made his debut just a few months before Rollins in 2004, and it took a very simple Google search to see the gruesome and barbaric nature of some of his matches in CZW. A brawler who was the jack of all trades and master of none, willing to put his body on the line and bring an authentic feel to a program which sometimes doesn't feel so authentic. Lastly, we had a pro athlete turned professional wrestler. From the gridiron to the mat was a man by the name of Leaki, but this wasn't just any football player turned wrestler. He was a member of the legendary Anawaii family, consisting of Yokozuna, Umaga, Rikishi, The Rock, among others. A football player who had aspirations of making it big time, but when that didn't work out because of circumstances out of his hand, he spent time up north in the CFL before eventually moving into the family business. An amazing physique, the embodiment of what WWE looked for in their top guys, but out of the three I've mentioned, the least seasoned. When three guys with completely different personalities, backgrounds, and styles were put together, you'd be surprised at what was about to happen. While they were perfecting their craft in Florida, one man was touring the world as the WWE Champion and that was CM Punk. He was holding the WWE title for what would eventually go on to be 434 days and he pitched the idea of having a group that would do his dirty work in efforts to keep things fresh. The idea suggested was a group of mercenaries, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and another independent star turned WWE recruit Cassius Ono, to which WWE liked the idea of two of them but instead wanted Roman Reigns to replace Ono. In the eyes of Vince McMahon and Triple H, it just didn't work. 
Survivor Series 2012 is where these three men would emerge from the crowd dressed in all black and dismantle Ryback and John Cena. For the uninformed, they had no clue who these guys were, but what we also didn't know was just how big of a moment we were witnessing. Quickly, they'd take out the biggest stars on the roster and go from unknowns to one of the top acts in the company. You had the unhinged one who had found something to believe in, the quiet powerhouse, the aerial artist. Together, they made the perfect combination of strength, brains, and grit. They also just looked cool, dressed in all black riot gear, mysterious and abrupt and when they appeared. A cool theme song to add to a methodical stalking of their opponents. They entered through the crowd which symbolized that they were invading the WWE and had no allegiance to any side or superstar, so that gave them a distinct feel right off the hop. The Shield would shoot these rugged, grainy, and shaky videos from undisclosed locations in the depth of the arena on a camcorder and spoken riddles of justice and ambition setting their goal and targeting everyone in their path. All three men devoted to the brotherhood and their mission to rise to the pinnacle of pro wrestling. In ring, Rollins and Ambrose would carry the majority of the offense in the match because Reigns was still inexperienced, and then he'd come in at the end and hit an emphatic power move to add an exclamation mark to the performance. Each man had their own defined trait that they brought to the group. They took out anyone and everyone in their path and that helped elevate them immediately. John Cena, Randy Orton, CM Punk, at one point Ambrose even got to wrestle Undertaker on SmackDown. WWE was giving the group a mega push, but it didn't matter, they were being used in a way that made sense and in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't being overdone. After this, they quickly captured gold. Rollins and Reigns won the tag team titles and Ambrose the US Championship at Extreme Rules 2013. They went undefeated for 7 whole months and racked up win after win. Three fists in the center representing a brotherhood of three individuals come together for a common goal. I've already done the Rise of the Shield on this channel so this isn't going to be that, you can check that out. Actually don't check that out because for some reason I was intent on ripping my vocal cords out. Anyways, organically these three transitioned into fan favorites by WrestleMania 30 in 2014 and after this they beat a reunited Evolution two straight times in two fantastic matches. They did so in dominant fashion. It was only fitting that the two biggest groups of their respective eras clashed, but just like Evolution, it was time for everyone to split and find their own path. On top of the wrestling world, having swept Evolution, we came to June 2nd, 2014, where with one swing of a chair, the shield would come to an end, but fittingly enough that steel chair would become a symbol not only in their story that was going to be told over the next 10 years, but the symbol of the day the shield died and the pillars of the future started to create their own unique path. What made things so interesting was to watch all three of these guys' journey, the trials and tribulations of them being their own commodity. Dean Ambrose was a loner who had found something to love in the shield, and he focused on the man who took everything he loved and ended it. So over the next little bit, Rollins and Ambrose focused on each other and slowly rose up the ranks. Rollins became a chicken shit heel while Ambrose was a disgruntled brawler out to seek revenge. Quite literally, the dynamic between these two was that of brothers, fighting in every which way you could imagine, but when push came to shove, especially in the later years, they'd reunite for a common goal. On the other end, Reigns quickly got catapulted into the main event to fan backlash. We all know how they rose up the ranks, but I want to take a look at something different. The Shield's greatest strength hasn't been their name, it hasn't been being pushed, it hasn't even been championships or matches. The Shield's greatest strength has been their ability to keep things fresh. When things run their course or when circumstance caused them to change, all three of them have been massive innovators in the past 10 years. So let's take a look at the different iterations of each man's character. The ability to keep things fresh is so pivotal in this business and I want to start with the person who's changed the most. Looking at these three, it's Seth Rollins. His range and actually being able to pull off whatever he brings to the table is something wrestling fans are very appreciative of. From serious to ridiculous to how the hell did he manage to pull that off. First, the architect. Half blonde, half brunette. What color is your hair? If you know, you know. When he was in the authority just being a slimy SOB coming out here saying that he was going to paralyze Edge, putting on bangers with John Cena, Brock Lesnar, and Dean Ambrose... Then he became the WWE Champion, following his ACL tear, fans had gotten behind Rollins because he just proved that he's good. His next major change would come in the form of the Kingslayer. Three years later, he'd been wronged in a main event match and he naturally built momentum with the crowd, beat Triple H at Mania and parlayed that momentum into going on a revenge tour and righting his wrongs, bringing back the group that he finished off. 
This move to burn it down Rollins where the crowd was fully behind him. With Brock Lesnar in retreat with Raw's top prize, Rollins simply used his in-ring proficiency to carry the show as Intercontinental Champion. Eventually, this bled into 2019 where he'd become one of the hottest acts in the WWE. But when things went awry and he faced The Fiend in that debacle of a match, his momentum fizzled out and he started to experiment with different characters. He used the fact that no one was listening to him to bring his new character to life. This one was called the Messiah, a cult leader who was just angry at the world, angry at anyone who didn't follow his message. A slower cadence to his promo and a newfound creativity, this slowly moved into the visionary slash drip god, where he dressed in over the top suits, dancing his way down to the ring, hysterically laughing at everything he saw while the fans serenaded him with his own entrance music. But he would become psychotic in the process, being overtly goofy and outlandish, but when push came to shove, would use tactical mind games and go where he needed to to have a mental advantage on his opponent. Whether it was the use of a costume, theme music, or finding some way to troll his opponent, he by contrast has had the most different iterations. From this, to this, to this, to whatever this is, and right back to this. Now that brings us to John Moxley, whose premise by the WWE didn't seem like it was understood, and I say that for a reason. In The Shield by many he was seen as the guy who was going to become the guy. He was going to be the big breakout single star. Obviously that didn't happen. Many times he found himself on the cusp of something before it would go south. Originally his character was all about being reactive and spontaneous. Someone who'd act in fits of rage and anger based on what happened on WWE TV and that would lead to some pretty extreme moments whether it was falling off the hell in a cell, providing comedic relief in an over the top way or throwing caution to the wind in an extreme rules match. But while the other two were put into more prominent positions, Ambrose was always the guy who was able to make basically everything work. For a majority of his WWE tenure, he was in the mid card. Opposed to someone like Rollins or even Reigns, he didn't have multiple different characters that you can look into with a unique set of characteristics on each. He was just crazy scrappy guy and that worked. First, it was the Lunatic Fringe from 2014 to 2016 where he just flat out fight whoever was in his path and never say die. The next era in his career came when he co-piloted the rise of SmackDown in 2016 as the brand's initial world champion, before again dropping down to a mid-card role. In 2018, we'd find ourselves with a Shield reunion, and he turned on Seth Rollins the night that they won the Tag Team Championships following an emotional announcement earlier in the night. Now it was his fifth different character, the moral compass of WWE, and here they had him wear gas masks and get vaccines in the ass. Well. A lot of us can see what they were aiming for here. The execution just didn't work and it didn't make sense. I'm also thankful that he didn't say that one line about Roman's cancer because that would have landed WWE into some massive trouble. Fans were frustrated. They were like, what are you doing with Ambrose? But they weren't the only ones frustrated. Ambrose wasn't happy with his position. He didn't renew his contract. He decided to go to AEW. And since he's been there, it's been literal perfection. The character of Jon Moxley is a scrappy brawler who brings you into the show with passion through his promos. And his promos have been something to marvel at. Gritty, real, and to the point. There's not much extra with the character he plays. He doesn't need a championship as the primary focus of his feuds. Doesn't matter if he bleeds, doesn't matter if he has to die trying, he's gonna do whatever it takes. And it just works. Earlier I talked about him bringing realness to something that doesn't necessarily feel real. The passion in his promos, they're just special. They add a layer of authenticity that you just didn't see in the WWE. And AEW fans, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. The rough around the edges, deep rooted realness that he brings is perfect. And let's not ignore the dude's workload either. He's had multiple years where he has a case for wrestler of the year. His style is something that's just different from everyone else. And you put him in the ring with anyone and he'll make things work. But coming out of the shield, there was one man who was a product of the machine. One man who didn't just have to fight his opponents, but had to fight audience backlash. Someone who from the onset was going to be the guy. And that is Roman Reigns. Opposed to Rollins and Ambrose who came from the indies, Reigns was a product of the WWE. He had the look that they desired. Vince McMahon hand selected him for the shield. And while early on fans were excited of the idea of him becoming a star, WWE fast tracked him way too quick. His first character iteration was that of an all conquering hero similar to Super Cena, but the character didn't have much depth to it aside from that. That coupled with awful dialogue like Suffer and Succotash Son, Magic Mohawk, Tater Tots, 
left fans rolling their eyes at what they were seeing. And for many, it was an unready, corporately created star who just didn't have things fleshed out just yet. In an era where fans made their voices heard more than ever, they didn't shy away from telling Roman that he flat out sucked. He kept almost all the shield presentation, the music, the look, the finish, the outfit. A lot of us saw it with him. You saw it, you saw the body, you saw where he could get to, but at that point, he just wasn't ready. For the first five years, he was presented as an all-conquering hero. In those five years, he went from shield reigns to big dog to the guy, and then he had this weird post-leukemia period where he was just kind of hovering around, like he had already been established, he'd already beaten notable names like Triple H, John Cena, Undertaker, Randy Orton, among others, but he wasn't really presented as a top guy. That, however, changed in 2020. In that year, he introduced us to his new creation of the Tribal Chief, maybe WWE's greatest final boss ever. Here, he found a new creative genius playing a bad guy, now going very heavy on focusing on the why of the story. Why was he telling this story? Focusing on promo work, using facial expressions, and well-plotted out stories to tell an underlying tale of a hated hero turned to everything the fans wanted. But now that he was everything the fans wanted, they didn't realize the animal that they've unleashed. He's hell-bent on protecting his and his family's legacy, beating everyone in his path, and bringing an unrivaled level of importance to the championships he holds. Paul Heyman by his side, a more vicious nature in his matches, using his strength to his advantage, a slow, methodical walk to the ring while he shifts the energy of any arena he walks into, he's become the biggest star in the wrestling business today. Big money matches, headlining WWE's premiere shows, the feel for Roman's matches is just something different. The atmosphere changes. Very few people can do that. No matter if you like or hate the guy, it's all eyes on him. Also, he's become a master of this last second kickout thing. If you know, you know what I'm talking about. He's the most dominant champion in 35 years in company history. His entire gimmick revolves around being the best. So for him, he's had the 2015 super push, the big dog slash the guy, that odd period in 2019, and now the tribal chief. Even with the mistimed pushes, there's something beautiful to it, isn't there? Like, as much hate as Reigns got, it's a perfect article to look back in history and go, Damn, they hated him so much, and now all these people are cheering for him. Look how far he's come. It's funny when things go so wrong, they become an article of time. You gotta fall back so far to pick yourself right back up again. And these three, they've done it. If not for the Hell in a Cell debacle, maybe we don't see Rollins experiment with different characters. If not for WWE failing to understand what Jon Moxley is, he doesn't go to AEW. If not for a literal pandemic, there's no final boss of the WWE. And I'm serious, it did happen because of the pandemic. But for the past decade, as cool as it's been to see the different iteration of their characters, their storytelling and depth of stories is something to marvel at. A lot of us kind of geek out over these stories and it has been really fun to follow what WWE is showing us. Rarely does the company reward its long term viewers. Storylines are oftentimes forgotten the following week, history is forgotten and tossed aside and sometimes it feels like they try to spite their viewers rather than reward them for watching no matter the circumstance. But with these three, everything is interconnected in a weird, perfect way, whether it's intentional or not. Their story for the past 10 years has had swerves, drama, betrayal, and everything else you could imagine. And it really took off at WrestleMania 31. You guys know how WrestleMania 21 was the launching point for the stars of the Ruthless Aggression era? Well, as of right now, this is kind of the Shield's night, and to be honest, it was only two of them, but that night's forever gonna have their stamp on it. This was supposed to be the night where WWE's chosen one was crowned, but instead it was stolen from underneath him by the same man who just 9 months previous hit him in the back with a chair. He had all the glory to himself, creating one of WWE's biggest moments ever. All the while these two were pushed in the main event, Ambrose was watching on from the mid card. He was fighting for the Intercontinental Championship in the show opener and continued to do so for a while after. In a weird way, when Rollins suffered an injury later that year and the championship which Reigns was chasing was vacated, Reigns won a tournament and accomplished his ultimate goal, basically taking it from that same man, and the man he beat in the tournament finals was Dean Ambrose. Ambrose kept waiting for his shot. The guy at one point was going to be the biggest breakout star of the Shield and he was just sitting there stuck in mid-card limbo. But that all changed at Money in the Bank 2016 where all three members of the Shield held the WWE Championship on the same night. A returning Seth Rollins beat Roman Reigns for the WWE title. 
a story WWE is still telling to this day, I might add, that Reigns can't beat Rollins when it matters most. But from behind came Mr. Money in the Bank Dean Ambrose to cash in and poetically pin the man who brought him so much pain and it was all worth it. He was now the WWE Champion on top of the industry. And now it was his time to shine. He retained that battleground in the Shield triple threat, which is really weird that this never happened at a WrestleMania. And if it never happens, might be one of WWE's biggest criminal sins ever. Regardless, through this, all three men would reunite here and there, but seemingly every time they did, it's like they were cursed. Someone would get sick, real life would intervene, or something would just go completely wrong. But when Rollins went on his redemption arc, the dynamic between Ambrose and him changed. It's a testament to the work of Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose that a simple fist bump could mean so much. How is it that a small hand gesture could hold such weight that it gave us this reaction? Rollins became the good guy, fighting for the people, and then Ambrose turned on Rollins the night their buddy announced his leukemia had come back. Just a few months later, after a short-lived feud between Rollins and Ambrose, they tell the story of Ambrose trying to trust both men again, and The Shield having one final goodbye. Ambrose left the company, and from here we jump to 2020 where the Tribal Chief was born. And in his lengthy reign, there were slow little hints of another Rollins and Reigns match, but it kept getting pushed off as both men would branch into other feuds. It's kind of fitting that right as it looked like they were about to face off, Rollins turned to Edge and Reigns turned to Cena, because in this generation, if you had to make a comparable to the previous one, that's probably it. We had to wait and wait and wait, but that led us to the 2022 Royal Rumble, where when out of opponents, Seth Rollins and the Shields theme music knocked on Roman's door and it was on. The story of Reigns not being able to beat Rollins when it mattered most continued and this time Seth Rollins was in his Joker phase. He got under the skin of a guy who had separated himself from the legacy of the Shield and became the guy in the industry. That same Roman Reigns who took a back seat to Seth Rollins at WrestleMania 31 said screw it, it's my time to shine. He became the biggest star in the industry. But it doesn't matter if you're the biggest star in the industry, if you can't beat this guy, what's the point? Before the Rumble, Reigns simply told Rollins that he hates him and he's tried to forgive him for what he's done but he'll never forgive him. Despite the trio reuniting multiple times, it's that underlying story of hatred, on the surface pretending like things are okay, but really holding a grudge for breaking someone's heart. At the Rumble, the mind games continued when Rollins used ring gear to get in the head of Reigns, coming down the aisle to the Shield's music and dressed as they used to. And clearly it worked because Reigns struggled to keep Rollins down until he himself didn't want to win but wanted revenge. It's like a light bulb went off in his head. He couldn't put Rollins down and when Seth Rollins mid-match put up a fist to remind Reigns of the Shield, he went into a place of denial and couldn't do anything more then choke out his old demons before eventually getting even. Getting even for 8 years of frustration, each chair shot more angry and rage fueled than the last. But guess what happened? Reigns technically didn't beat Rollins. There's so many more intricacies we can dig into, but before I end things off, I want to take a look at the entertainment value that these three men have brought us over the past 10 years. Let's take a look at some of the matches. First off, the biggest criminal sin I've committed on this channel is not mentioning the Wyatt and Shield match from 2014, so there you go. Of course, their matches against Evolution. Once all three men split up though, they built an amazing catalog of matches and rivalries, starting off with John Moxley slash Dean Ambrose. His premier rivalries have came against Seth Rollins, Bray Wyatt, Kevin Owens, and AJ Styles. The matches that he's always excelled at are those matches where he can just go a million miles per hour, just let him wild out, let him throw caution to the wind, and he's been so, so insanely good in AEW. No disrespect to Omega, but Moxley with his matches has become the consistency GOAT for AEW, against Omega, Wheeler Yuta, Brian Danielson, among others. For Reigns, he's had a ton of big money matches, especially in his current run as a Tribal Chief, basically dismantling what feels like the entire roster and bringing a level of prestige to the titles that we haven't seen in a very long time. His best rivalry is against Seth Rollins because, like I said, 
That story has so many different intricacies. I'm going to get flamed for this one, but I think Brock Lesnar also deserves to be up there despite what many people think of the rivalry. For him, he's had some great matches against AJ Styles, Braun Strowman against Edge and Bryan and also Bryan on his own. 2020 inside Hell in a Cell against Jey Uso, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really liked it. Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam 2022 and the catalog just goes on forever. And finally, Seth Rollins. He, like the other two, has some flat out insane matches, but I look at it like this. If I had to introduce Seth Rollins to a non-wrestling fan or someone who's new to wrestling, I'd tell them to watch the rivalry, the matches, and the promos against Edge. Those were quite literally all hits, no misses. All of them have excelled in the ring like no other. I've made a really bad habit of making extremely long videos, so I didn't get into it too much, but we could be here forever talking about their matches. As the recording of this video, the trio have combined for 14 championships across two companies. They've competed in over 1,600 televised matches in the past decade and have a combined win percentage of around 60%. Among them, they shared two Royal Rumble wins, all are Grand Slam winners. But the craziest stat of all of them is in the past 10 years, the most time one single person has missed is seven months. That shows you the consistency that they've had. So as you can see for the past 10 years through the ups, the downs, the shield has always been the constant. It's a good question to think how the WWE would look without them. If these three were still pushed but didn't come in together, would all these intricacies, all these different stories, all these matches, all these character innovations, would they hold as much weight? It's a good question to think about. Across the span of a decade, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and Dean Ambrose were able to tell a sprawling tale of three very different characters rising through the ranks of the biggest professional wrestling company in the world, fighting each other, reuniting, breaking up, and separately dominating the North American professional wrestling world. The camaraderie shared between these three is a dynamic that'll just always work. When three of them are on screen together, it just makes things special. The Shield as a brand is the most popular WWE has built in the past 10 years and all three men's longevity is a testament that WWE did make the right decision. Whether it's acknowledging your tribal chief, singing wild thing, or screaming burn it down at the top of your lungs, enjoy. These three men understand their place in history. They know how to take you on an emotional journey through their storytelling. There are factions that have held more gold, dominated more as a faction. Others reign supreme at more praised periods in wrestling history. But no other faction has told a story like The Shield. No other faction has had these three's path. No matter what company they may go to, no matter how far from each other all three guys may be, no matter if they hold championship gold or not, at the end of the day, these three guys will always be joined at the hip and remembered as one. The story of The Shield is one that continues to be written and maybe in another 10 years, they'll have surpassed even what we thought possible of them today. Dominating in short term is easy, but having your fingerprints all over a company or even two companies and consistently being the go-to guys can only be described in two words, pure dominance. Take care guys.